complicated, you know, man. It's like a damn Rubik's cube, man. You like talking about a blue bread, man. Then you get to one side, then like man. All right, before I welcome our guest on, just a quick word from our sponsor. All right, CJ Angle, welcome back to the Jay Burton Show. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I greatly enjoyed our last conversation. And this is sort of a, a follow-on conversation from one you had with, with Pete Quinones about the concept mm -hmm. of rights. I think this is an important conversation to have because oftentimes you hear you know, both the, the language of conservatives and sort of the the thrusts of the DEI, you know, woke regime couched in terms of rights. And while they're both sort of speaking in the same terms, it's very obvious that these these visions are completely and totally incompatible. And I think, you know, yourself and and me and some some other people have sort of, you know, started poking at this issue of, you know, it, do we need to speak in terms of rights? Like is that a useful frame anymore? Mm. And so uh, I, I'm curious, right? Maybe it's it's best to start with some history. Where, where do we see the genesis of this term rights in a political sense? And how does that change and evolve over time? Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's interesting because, <clears throat> you know, we're going to talk about the fact that the, the left uses the rhetoric and framing of rights to achieve their political endeavors, <clears throat> to, achieve, to achieve their political objectives. But they've been doing that for a long time. You know, in the 1930s, <clears throat> excuse me, you had FDR, you know, his entire, you know, political um, agenda was couched in his four freedoms, right? So he had these, they always speak in terms of liberty and freedom and things like that. And um, Aristotle, I think, had the phrase, the revolution within the word. So you keep the, um, you know, the, the vocabulary, the rhetorical framing, the, the paradigm, the way that we use vocabulary to express ourselves politically. They use that and they can revolutionize the entire system, but still the people are using the same words that they're used to. And that's a very powerful mechanism of achieving political uh, objectives if you're a revolutionary, which, you know, FDR was one of the key pinpoints of the managerial revolution in America. And he can completely transformed American socio-political life. And he did so while using historically laden uh, language, you know, so this is, this is something that the left does and it'd be interesting to get more into that uh, in the 1930s and also how it transpired in the 1960s. And of course we're seeing it today, but rights has been part of our language, our political language in the West since, you know, at least the Magna Carta in the 13th century. So we've always used the rights of of a given people. You know, we we speak in terms of there's this dynamic between um, individuals or groups or uh, you know interest groups and the state or the you know the the dynamic between the state and the church. So rights is is part of that long and deep history. So it's not like rights is some new 20th century thing that we um, have have only now. Uh, you know, come to realize is helpful to us or something. This is this is part of our deep history. And in in order to properly think about rights, we need to understand the fact that it is part of our soul. But the very fact that it's part of our political soul makes us susceptible to putting our guards down whenever we hear that type of rhetoric. That's why the left is so uh, devious and, and cunning in the way that it uses language, because it is part of our deep political memory as Westerners to um, think positively about that type of rhetoric. Um, so rights has, has long been here. It's it's not a new thing. It's not an American thing. It's not a um, it's not a thing of modernity. It's it's it precedes modernity. I mean rights. I mean you. I mean I don't. Rights have probably even been um, something that we talked about before the Magna Carta. Um, so it's it's like what are rights? What to what extent should we use them? What do they mean? Um, what do they not mean? So these are things that we have to talk about, but we have, we have rights as part of our, our Western heritage. I mean, that's, that's a key aspect to rethinking, uh, rights and the role that it's going to have in political activity. 
So I think one of the the most interesting questions when we talk about rights is where do these these privileges derive from? You know, when you read the American the American founders, they're calling back to a some sort of tradition. Right. right? There are sort of rights granted to, to English people. The king was not fulfilling his end of the bargain. And mm -hmm. so the compact between the two is is null and void. Right. right? It's why when we, when we talk about the American Revolution, it's probably not particularly well characterized as a revolution, right? Mm -hmm. There's not an upending of the social order per se. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I thought was interesting enough that I, I wrote an article about, even though it's been been quite a while, is you know this recent Second Amendment case mm -hmm. where uh, an Obama appointed judge basically said, you know, illegal immigrants to the U.S. do they are under Second Amendment protections. Mm -hmm. Me that that is that represents a fundamental shift from the idea that you know rights are due to members of a civilization, members of a tradition. Mm -hmm. right? You know, us as as English have always interacted with our king in such way. This is the sort of you know assumed rules of something versus rights are you know universal promises owed to all men. And mm -hmm. to me, I think that that's a, a fundamental difference in scope. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, that's what I call universalism versus particularism in, in rights. And so there's there's sort of like you could trace back, you know, to you, there's more than this, but two general traditions of of rights in terms of like, you know, the, the coming of, of the modern age, you know, in, in the 18th century, you had English people like Edmund Burke um, you know, David, conservatives like David Hume, you know, they would use rhetoric like rights, uh, but they meant something very different. They had a completely different paradigm in their head when they talked about rights compared to, you know, some of the more continental enlightenment thinkers, especially in, in France. And so French, French thinkers would emphasize the universality. Um, and, and, and there's this, there's this model of man that he's separate from his own place his own heritage and that he is sort of manic in the you know against the entire world and he is infused with these rights either by god or by nature um and they precede society the english tradition didn't think of rights as preceding society but rather being generated through the process of history this is sort of you could even call it like a historicist model of rights generation like where do we get the rights we we work them out through history and and since history is contained by the experiences of a particular people and history or a particular heritage um rights basically are generated through history you could say they're from god but history is a mediator between god and the rights bearers and the rights bearers are uh Englishmen, um, they have their own particular uh, understanding and tradition of rights, and so therefore they're English rights. And it makes no sense to conceive of some, you know, random Pakistani or Indian person as as having these these rights because they're rights that belong to Englishmen, and they're rights that were mediated through their own uh, experiences uh, in in England and in in Britain. And so that's that's a that's very much a historicist or a particularist conception of rights, which is at odds with, you know, the French universalist view of rights. And at the American founding, uh, there was a tension there. There were these two traditions were were basically coexistent at the time because both of them could be used to achieve the the objectives of the American political class. I mean, you have people like conservatives like John Adams, you know, or Alexander Hamilton, and you had radicals like uh, Thomas Paine, and both of them could utilize the framing of, of rights to achieve their political ends, which was separation from England. Um, but, they, but they conceived of the origin and the purpose uh, and the, um, the constraints or the boundaries on this rights rhetoric in completely different ways. You know, one of them saw themselves as um, repudiating the innovations of the English monarchy and preserving the rights of their own um, their own culture that had been handed down to them over the centuries. And that would be the conservative take. And then you have more of the revolutionary mode of mind, which is Thomas Paine. And he thought of himself as basically unshackling man from history and 
um, you know, they, they, they thought of society as something that were, was undermining the rights of man. So you have these two very different conceptions of rights. And I think the first one, it largely died out in the 20th century. I mean, there were people like Russell Kirk, um, Richard Weaver, you know, the, the entire, you know, Southern tradition is, is very much this rooted situationalist conception of rights. Um, but they were purged from the conservative movement. And so conservatives took on this universalistic, individualistic paradigm of rights. And they used this for political reasons, because the entire point of the conservative movement in America in the 1950s and 60s and, and 70s was basically to uh, have an opposition stand against communism and you have people like bill buckley and the rise of the new right you know the post-war new right and the neoconservatives and they would all use rights in this universalistic sense because they needed to apply that paradigm against communism which was a suppressor of rights and you, you there's no way that that liberals could argue for the uh, the rights of Eastern Europeans um, to be free from communism if your paradigm of rights is rooted in the English experience or what have you. It makes no sense. So you need this universal paradigm um, to make the case against communism, or at least that was their argument. Um, the America Firsters, the, the paleoconservatives, they they were not interested in setting the world free or liberating the world or bringing individual rights and individual freedoms um, to Central Europe or Eastern Europe or Asia or anything like that. It made no sense to them. They were only concerned about preserving their own heritage. And that's so they, they very much had that old fashioned conception of rights that was rooted, contextualized, historicist. Um, and it made no sense for them to think in terms of universal ideals. Uh, they lost out, right? And the the new conserv the neoconservatives uh, basically won the day, captured the conservative movement, and it's and when we think of conservatism now, we think of Ronald Reagan and, and George Bush and other universalists. And, you know, there were people like Pat Buchanan and others that were more, you know, focused on their own traditions. And that's coming back for sure. But we've sort of reached the end game. I mean, yeah, if, if, if rights is, are this universal thing, then then there's no reason we shouldn't invite the world and apply the Second Amendment, the First Amendment to the third world. You know, invite them in. There's It would be an oppression. It would be denying their rights um, to withhold, um, you know, constitutional guarantees to anybody who wants to, to come into our area. And so you have this, this tension now, and conservatives are becoming more right wing. And what that means is they are recognizing the dangers in universal rights and how it can be abused for the sake of internationalist political objectives. I think it's it's important to realize, you know, in talking about the neoconservatives, right, the, the Trotskyist roots of the neoconservative movement. You know, I think that there's no irony that, you know, when, when we see the split in the USSR between the Stalinists and the Trotskyists, it's basically on the in the question of, you know, is, is communism, you know, is it is it socialism in one country, right? Is this a, a Russian project or is mm -hmm. it an internationalist project? And, mm -hmm. you know, even if we can say, and I, I think it's probably unfair to call someone like, you know, Bill Crystal a communist, but nonetheless, it seems they've kept their, their priors with them, right? The idea that, you know, there is some sort of, you know, redemptive project that needs to be spread over the whole earth, you know, and whether well, that is, that is communism exactly. or, or freedom, I think that there is very much an ideological through line there. Well, they, they stopped being communists, but they didn't stop they didn't stop with their Trotsky eye instincts. Right. So that, that sort of universalism. Um, I mean, and, and so you, you see this really natural fusion between these ex Trotskyites that had this instinct to um, look at the entire world as a landscape or a theater for their project, for their political project. Um, and that's, that's basically just one flavor of, of Wilsonianism and his attempt to make the world safe for democracy. So this universalist uh, mentality, yes, it shows up in the Trotskyites, but it's very much um, consistent with the Wilsonian frame of mind. And that's why Woodrow Wilson is their, you know, like a key figure in, in the way that they think about foreign policy. They're Wilsonians too. So yeah, so the, the Trotskyite roots need to be emphasized but also, you know, there is an America, a progressivist, they're progressives, they do have that mentality and they despise people like Herbert Hoover and others who have more of an America first instinct or demeanor. 
So, so yes, I think that we should emphasize they're not communists, but they definitely have a Trotskyite internationalist view of the world. And, and what they despised most about Stalin is that Stalin had a, a nationalistic understanding of his political priorities, and, and that's what they hated. Um, so yeah, we, I mean, that's, that's part of that old, that old dynamic, you know, like for, 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 uh, for Stalin, he, he was just completely disinterested in any internationalist, um, you know, borderless, you know, view of, of man, which, which is very much describes neoconservatism and also neoliberalism. Um, so we have to recognize the fact that, that rights are being employed, the rhetoric of rights are being employed in a way that undermines um, this America first heritage preservation of, of heritage. And I think that's, what's so nefarious and dangerous about it is we're used to, we grew up with the language of rights. We grew up with the language of the declaration of, of independence. And there's no uh, recognition of, of like the, the political context of that document, the purpose that it served. And as soon as we begin to universalize it, we begin to set the stage for those who are willing to use rights rhetoric to undermine our way of life. I think that it's it's no it's no shock that the same people that you know seek to extend you know, the rights and and privileges traditionally associated with you know American citizens have also desired to extend American citizenship either de jure or de facto to you know, infinite numbers of people, right? You, 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 it, it kind of, rec one recalls the, the idea of, you know, 1 billion Americans. And so what is the relationship between rights and citizenship, uh, particularly in, in kind of a more historic sense? And then how has that relationship evolved? Yeah, so I do think that there was a tie between the citizen and the rights and, and rights did not precede citizenship but actually followed citizenship. In other words, rights are something that people get when they belong in a certain way to a political community. Um, and I, th I, th I also think it's a um, like a derivative of our equalitarian uh, demeanor, you know, our, our equalitarian social instincts that make us uncomfortable with the idea that only certain people within a political order can have these rights, namely only citizens. And even among these citizens, there are those who um, exist at a at a at an inferior level and a superior level. I mean, fathers and and children. I mean, there's there's an inferiority and superiority, and and nothing bothers the revolutionary international spirit more than these sorts of um, inherited hierarchies. Um, but that's that's part of the the function of those things is to facilitate you know, the, the continuity of a way of life between one generation and the other. And so these types of hier hierarchies are important. But today, you know, hierarchy is not something that's it's acceptable or palatable at all. Um, you know, this equalitarian mindset actually caters to internationalism and universalism in politics. Uh, rights can play, you know, very heavily into that rhetoric. You know, we we, we are like, even as conservatives, I mean, I remember when I was, uh, you know, just, just naturally, because it's the, the world that we're born into, we have this neoconservative instinct, because that's what we, that's what we were trained when we were children to have this universalist instinct. So when we think of things like voting rights being denied to certain groups of people, that really bothers us because we've been trained with this universalistic instinct. And, and it's hard for us to think outside of that and to think our, of our heritage as being threatened um, by those things. And so we, we have this instinct to apply rights to all individuals the world round. And it's a contradiction for us to think of the state as putting boundaries on um, the application of those rights. That makes us very uncomfortable. Um, but I think this is one of the things that the, the current right, you know, the it's hard to call it the new right because when I think of the new right, I actually think of like the post-war right that replaced the old right. So it's like this new, new right that's actually re resurging the, the themes and principles of the old right. But, but anyways, but this new, new right is rediscovering the fact that we need to abandon this universalism because the consequences of universalism is the liquidation of our, of our heritage. 
Um, and so like, so this is what kind of what you asked me in the beginning about like, you know, where, where do rights come from? How should we conceive of rights? I think the best way to conceive of rights is something that was bequeathed to us. It's something that we inherited from our forefathers who achieved these things through the dynamics of history and politics. Um, it's not something that Robinson Crusoe had on an island. Rights are not something that are given to man in that way. Rather, they have to be mediated, made concrete through the experiences and struggles of the history of a specific people group. And I think that's where rights come from. And when we think of rights in that way, then suddenly there's an alignment between the rhetoric of rights and uh, our way of life. You know, all of our customs and norms and mores, the things that we do, the memories that we share, there's an alignment between all of those things that are part of our heritage and the language of rights. But if the language of rights is separated from that heritage, we suddenly have the rhetorical power of a revolutionary political movement that can basically just use the language and rhetoric of rights as a rationalization to undermine our way of life. And so rights is used today in a way that basically threatens um, our ability to uh, live in, in, in a way um, uh, consistent with or in honor to um, the the heritage that we have um, been bequeathed to us. So I think that the the rights need to be rooted in something um, real, something realist. They need to be rooted in a particular uh, hist historical framework. Otherwise, they become tools of revolution. Yeah, that that's an interesting point. To me, it, it echoes what De Maestra says about constitutions. Right, that mm -hmm. constitutions cannot constrain a state. So effectively, what a constitution is, is a written down kind of a, a codified version of, you know, the, the spirit and culture of a people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a it's good that you bring up the idea of of realism. Right. Because I, I get quite frustrated with with conservatives mm -hmm. who who speak about rights and speak about the Constitution in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And it, it has nothing to do with how I feel about the actual written letter of the Constitution. It, it's largely you know, irrelevant to that. My point is just, you know, that that document no longer has the same hold it once did. You know, if, if no one believes in it, right, or if only, you know, middle class conservatives who have no power believe in it, it, it effectively, you know, matters just as much to our daily life as, you know, the, the Code of Hammurabi or, you know, any other ancient document, right? It is, and, and don't get me wrong, it's not completely untethered. Right. We've seen that there are certain justices, there are certain parts of the government that seem to have a, a connection to that document and a connection to its kind of strictures. But I think that what we're watching and recently there is a, a case in a case in New York. Uh, I cannot remember the details. I believe it was it was someone in New York who was arrested for for home gunsmithing. And mm -hmm. yeah, the, the judge there said something sort of unintentionally true where she said, you know, don't bring the Second Amendment in here. We don't do that in New York, mm -hmm. uh, which is completely and totally true, right? Mm -hmm. It is it is completely accurate. And who knows, you know, he may end up getting out of this at a, at a higher level court. But I think if, if we kind of look into the future, it seems that, you know, fewer and fewer judges and lawyers and, and government bureaucrats seem to have the same connection to these documents, to this conception of rights that, that you and I make. And so at a certain point, you know, being textually correct doesn't really matter. What matters is effectively what do the people in charge think are, you know, your rights. And I don't say that in a triumphant way. I'm not glad that is the case, but I think that's the most realistic way to look at this situation. Yeah, when you bring up the Constitution, it's interesting because, you know, it's a, it's, it's a difficult topic. Um, the first thing I'll say is, you know, on one hand, in the 18th century, the Constitution was very much a centralizing document. And I have more decentralized um, instincts. And so, you know, I can call it something that was um, dangerous, you know, like Patrick Henry smelled a rat and seemed to be right. On the other hand, you know, in the early 19th century, the Constitution was something um, that was useful. It was useful that the that that there could be a rallying point for constraining, you know, the, the the federal government because the constitution basically gave 
the federal government very specific powers and left the, everything else to the states, you know, which is a very healthy way of doing things. And it'd be great to return to that. The fact of the matter is uh, in the late 19th century and the 20th century, the Constitution was completely destroyed. It's decimated, doesn't exist. The Constitution is a formality and it's already been undermined at every single, you know, every, at every single angle, every single layer, every single, you know, at, at, in every institution in the American managerial bureaucratic apparatus, the Constitution is a dead letter. It doesn't exist. But the function of the Constitution today politically is is for the, the left, which owns the institutions, it allows the left to suppress and, and put a chain on its would-be opponents because its would-be opponents are so principled that they refuse to um, contradict the, the Constitution at all. At the same time, while the, the establishment, uh, you know, just doesn't care about it doesn't care about the constitution, doesn't care about the restraints, doesn't care to limit itself. And so it's this, it's this really um, fascinating dynamic where those who believe in the constitution bind themselves to it. And those who hate the constitution, uh, you know, put those chains on its would be opponents. And it's a very fascinating dynamic because um, it allows the left to basically continue on in its own march uh, without any opposition at all. So the constitution I think was a, a fine thing at one point, but the fact of the matter, it doesn't exist. And the only purpose that it serves is to suppress the would be um, opposition to the establishment. That's, that's literally, I think it's function because Republicans will, will constantly cite the, the, the constitution in a way that um, disallows their own action um, and does nothing to restrain the establishment and its agenda for, for the United States of America. That's, I think that's sort of the purpose of the constitution. So if, in my opinion, if you like the Constitution and if you want to return to that, you have to first defeat the enemy. You have to first, um, it, since the Constitution doesn't exist, you first have to establish political dominance and um, set up the the um, environment for us to uh, reapply the Constitution, if that's even possible. But things like constitutional law, things like the the rule of law, things like constitutional paradigms, all of those things are actually downstream from politics. Politics has to be taken care of first. Once the friend-enemy distinction has worked itself out, then we can apply the Constitution uh, in a helpful way. But if you have enemies that are running things, um, it's, I think it's kind of a fool's errand to focus all of your efforts on the Constitution and to focus none of your efforts on the wielding of power against those who hate your way of life. Well, and that, that brings up, you know, Schmidt's conception of politics, right? That much in the same way that, you know, many of us were educated to view the Constitution as this sort of, you know, this magic limiting factor on the government, right? You know, it, it's sort of like putting out a line of salt, right? A vampire can't cross it. You know, the government can't cross this, the Constitution is sort of the story we're told. We're, we're so, told a, a similar incorrect line about politics, right? We're presented this, this conception of politics as a dialogue, as a marketplace between competing ideals. Mm -hmm. But Schmidt has this idea of, of politics as basically, you know, politics is what happens when you have a group of people who have mutually exclusive views about, you know, a way of life. Right, that your friends are those people who are sort of grouped together to to su support a certain way of life. Your enemies are those who would see that way of life, you know, made impossible. And I, I think that what we've seen is that obviously politics is, is sort of in the nature of man, right? You know, mm -hmm. Aristotle's definition of man is the political animal. Well, that's true. I, I think we also need to look at the the scope of what is considered fair game in American politics mm -hmm. has grown to be effectively all consuming. You know, mm -hmm. this kind of like friend enemy distinction is apparent in any number of little signals, right? And so to call back to the incorrect kind of civics class training you received as, you know, to be a political actor in the American system. One, mm -hmm. that wasn't true when you were taught, it, right? That was a misrepresentation. But it is even less true given the increased scope of politics we see today, mm -hmm. right? You know, I, I'm, you know, I'm a younger man, but even in the Bush era, I remember that, you know, politics was contentious, but nowhere near as all-consuming as it was between 2020 and 2022, for instance. 
you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot is, you know, for Generation Z, any number of things are politi political signifiers, right? That you can be marked out, you know, you can, you can have your power level revealed by which social media apps you use. You know, the, the one, the stupid example I always use, but it's very true, is what tobacco products you use. Zins are right wing coded. If you vape, you're a left winger. And as mm -hmm. stupid as that sounds, right, that shows the extent to which all of society has become politicized. You know, that friend enemy distinction is no longer broken down along civilizational levels or even state levels or city levels, but it is completely internecine. Mm -hmm. And so to look at that as, oh, well, you know, even though, you know, the people to my left and the people to my right have fundamentally different ideas about, you know, the nature of a man, you know, where we derive truth from kind of like the ultimate end of man. Well, I can't be, you know, I, I have to abide by, you know, the sort of Robert's rules of politics to me is a losing game. And we know it's a losing game because look at the American conservative movement. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can think of maybe one and a half things the conservative movement have won at during my entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. Right. And both of those were significant departures from the the kind of post-war conservative uh, conservative line. But anyway, sorry, man, back to you. No, I, I, I agree with all that. And um, there's this idea that, um, you know, like you bring up the, the friend enemy distinction um, and, and also the fact that uh, everything in, in social cultural life is now political. These are the consequences actually of denying the friend enemy distinction. When you have no platform, when you have no stage on which the friends and the enemies can, can meet in, in battle, then, and you suppress that, you kind of hide it behind a veil. What happens is all of political life outside of the state becomes political. And this is what, he, this is what, Carl Schmidt warned against and, and Antonio Gramsci also predicted as or not only predicted, but um, advocated for if you want to politicize society in a in a world where we have to pretend like we can transcend politics because we have these universal like um, laws like rights. If you want to pretend like we can transcend that and we don't no longer have to talk about friends and enemies. Well, what's going to happen is um culture itself is going to become radicalized because that that dynamic between friends and enemies needs to find its expression somewhere it it's it has to go somewhere it, you can't just you know wish it away and so when we when we treat the state as if it was this liberal project and there's no friends there's no enemies we're all just a debating society and we're coming together meeting of the minds and going to hash out um the best ideal of a you know, a good society and, and, a, and a good future vision for America. When you treat politics like that, you begin to radicalize things at, in, the, in the private sphere. Um, so it's, it's like pushing a, um, you know, a beach ball under the water. Like you can push it down, but it's going to pop up somewhere else. You can no longer, you can't get that thing to stay under. And so now what's happened is every aspect of our lives is political and the project to transcend politics. That was sort of the liberal that was sort of the liberal liberal goal in the 20th century was to transcend politics, to leave politics in the past. This idea that we have to clash with other group interests and, uh, you know, only one can win out. This is something that was considered to be medieval, outdated, archaic, something that we no longer needed because we're, you know, we're at the zenith of history. Democracy, liberal democracy was the final achievement of political man. And, and so this idea in the 20th century that we could transcend politics, I think, has utterly failed. What we realized was that politics is core to man, that there are groups of friends that you need to be fighting with for your way of life, because there are enemies out there who seek to instill their own vision of the world. And that vision of the world is mutually exclusive when you're uh, then you're with your own. You cannot have both of these. And what happens when your friends lay down their swords because they're committed to liberalism, while your enemies are picking up guns because they're not committed to liberalism, which group do you think is going to win? I mean, this is a point that that Aaron McIntyre makes, but this is also, I mean, he got that from James Burnham. Uh, you know, he talked about the fact that that liberalism was basically he gave this analogy of a crab that was um, taking off its shell. And uh, when he took off his shell, he was no longer protected. and He was completely, um, you know, naked before all of his en sea enemies on the ocean floor during that transition from one shell. And he could be basically devoured during that time. And that's what liberalism is. It's this it's this taking off of our protective layer. 
um, all the things that that were that you, that that were important for the protection of of Western political life was basically taken off in this grand quest toward a liberal society. And what happened during that time was not that we overcame politics, but that politics devoured us. And um, the left completely took advantage of that. And the left doesn't care about um, individual rights. It doesn't care about uh, the right to free speech. It doesn't care about any of those things. But we conservatives have been relocated to using the old rhetoric of liberalism to fight back against a revolutionary left. And it's obviously not working. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there. You know, I, I think that when we define these two camps of, of left versus right, I, I think that at, it, at its essence, it is a belief in, you know, the right is effectively a belief in value and a belief in hierarchy, right? Some things are, are better than others. And for the left, it is a belief in inequality. And from that, you know, very closely connected to that core belief is the idea of the blank slate. Right, that effectively all humans are interchangeable widgets, right? And all the differences we see are not innate. You know, they're not due to you know, individual virtues and vices within any one man, but it is, you know, some sort of social pressure. And when it gets back to that idea of solving politics, right? The idea that conflict is something, you know, people are taught. And you see this in kind of you know, liberal phrases from yesteryear, like teach men not to rape, right? Mm -hmm. Which is this idea that that kind of bad behavior is one that's sort of injected into their brains by society. You know, it, it's sort of a therapeutic attitude towards quote unquote negative behavior, right? That it needs to be sort of managed out of existence. And whether that is, is politics, that is conflict between any one group, you know, whether that's these sort of kind of like human predation, and look, I'm not saying any of those things are good. That's not my point. Something being natural to humans obviously does not make it good, right? But I think that it's, it's sort of an interesting uh, assumption from that. You know, I was talking with a guy last night and the conversation came up like, well, what is our, what is our end goal? Like, what do we want? Mm -hmm. And I, I think one of the things that sets us apart from, you know, the, the utopians, you know, whether we consider that the left more broadly or people like libertarians is, you know, effectively, there are negative aspects of human nature that I don't think can be solved. You know, mm -hmm. conflict is innate to conditions of, I wouldn't say it's innate to conditions of scarcity. I mean, scarcity is often the, you know, the, you know, kind of the instigating, you know, matter. But I mean, I, it seems like we don't have a lot of scarcity in the West and we still have quite a bit of conflict. But nonetheless, right, it's this idea that, you know, we, we can... We can have better or worse government. You know, we can have a society that is more functional than ours, but you are never going to abolish politics. You are never going to, you know, at least in this world, make the lion lie down with the lamb. And mm -hmm. I think that that's an interesting difference between whatever we consider our camp, our guys, and, you know, the liberals. And it seems like from a certain perspective, even if they don't like to hear it, our conservatives are more committed liberals than the left, at least currently. Precisely. I say this all the time. The left is not liberal. The left are not the liberals. The liberals are the ones that want to pretend like politics can be avoided. That's, I think, I mean, that was Carl Schmitt's definition of a liberal is someone that thought that, that society, civil society could overcome politics. That's the liberal. Um, the left are actually Schmittians. <laughs> they understand that there is a dynamic between friends and enemies. Um, and they've, they've, I mean, they're, they're, the left have become the masters at political strategy. So they've internalized and absorbed Carl Schmitt, this friend enemy distinction. And at the same time, they've, um, they've convinced conservatives that Carl Schmitt should never be read or studied because he's a very dangerous, evil German man. And you're like, so you have this group of political actors that have absorbed the lessons of liberalism's greatest critic. And at the same time, that group of people that have absorbed Schmidtian lessons, they're telling their opposition to not absorb those lessons. What do you think is going on there? 
the left is not liberals, but they have a very keen sense of the fact that it benefits them when their enemies are liberals. And so for for a century now, conservatives have been absorbing this liberalism, this assumption that we can avoid the friend enemy distinction and we can talk about politics um, or political, you know, civil concerns in the rhetoric of individual rights that are universal. We can talk about, um, you know, the, the civil rights movement as something that um, is actually a very conservative thing. And you've got all of these brainwashed conservatives that have completely absorbed the rhetorical, the, the, the tactical rhetorical um you, the, the, you know, the tactics of, of the rhetorical revolution, they've absorbed it all. The conservatives have completely eaten it up. They've become the new liberals. And the essence of liberalism is laying down your swords. And so the left has convinced its opposition to lay down its swords in in the context of its own effort to capture the castle. And it's this, it's just this fascinating image that I have of, um, you know, the, the people marching toward a castle convincing the the guards at the gate to basically just uh, you know unhinge the gate and just take it down because we're all friends now and it's like this complete trojan horse it's become this complete trick um that conservatives are basically neutering themselves and neutralizing themselves um for the sake of a rhetorical body of of strategy that the left doesn't even buy for itself i think it's fascinating and it would be amusing if it wasn't so disastrous to to my people you know I think that that, that that brings up a, a, another point, right? Which is that, you know, if you accept that you're in a conflict, you know, a, a, a political conflict, you know, why would you ask your enemy for advice? You know, it's sort of asking the, asking the fox to design the hen house. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, a, that's an interesting dynamic we see in American conservatism. And I, I think that it is important to, to say that one, American conservatism is not a contiguous tradition, right? You know, that it's sort of, it, it, at least in my mind, it sort of springs out of, it sort of springs out of, you know, what we consider the old right, which was in opposition to FDR. You know, we, we mentioned the sort of injection of neoconservatives. And while there is a sort of an alternate tradition that is very much on the right, we, we can kind of track a line from the paleoconservatives you know, through the, the kind of Southern Jeffersonian tradition. That's not necessarily what I'm referring to. But nonetheless, you know, there is this sort of, at one time, kind of hatred for the liberal establishment, and then also a, a sort of desperate desire for approval from them. And you see this in a lot of conservative media. So for instance, right, uh, the Daily Wire produces movies. They had... Uh, Gina Carano, who is a WWE star, fired for her conservative views. They made a movie. And what do they do when you have a movie? Well, you have a red carpet, of course. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a lame red carpet. You know, it's like the, the my mom gave me a bowl cut version of it. <laughs> but but nonetheless, it is sort of aping the, the political forms of you know, the liberal elite and the liberal establishment. And to yeah. me, I see this as a, as a massive problem because, again, much like you know, we've talked about with looking for political strategy, if you were looking from for approval from your political opponents, the only time they will give that to you is if you are either bending the knee or doing something so positively stupid that you are handing victory to them. Exactly. And I think that's something we see oftentimes in, in the evangelical world, right? Which is that there are people who are completely desperate for approval from regime sources, you know, bending over backwards, throwing their their compatriots under the bus for being any one of, you know, the the, the kind of bingo card of, of ists and isms that are, you know, make you a social pariah. And yeah, sure, they might get a little bit of, of praise, you know, they might get one article, but that doesn't last. And not mm -hmm. only does it not last, not only is it not, you know, a, a worthwhile end goal, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, it doesn't accomplish the goal they think it will. Right. There's no moment that you will make yourself palatable enough that you will be able to sort of take over the, you know, the, the popularity of the, the establishment. Right. They control all the cards. And so this attempt to sort of curry favor by making yourself amenable to them, you know, whether that is, you know, in a political sense, a social sense, a religious sense, to me, I see as a fool's errand. And again, like many things, you know, 
we, we've seen this playbook run over and over and over again. And to me, one of the many reasons that I, I spend so much time kind of trash talking American conservatives is not that they're bad people. They're good people. They're probably the best people in America. But it's just like, you know, it's Charlie Brown in the football. Like, mm-hmm. OK, the 10th time that Lucy's pulled the football away and you kind of cartwheel through the air and land on your back. Don't get mad at me when I suggest maybe don't kick the football this time. You yeah. know, just just a just a thought. Yeah. And it's funny because they're 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 doing that every time and everyone's telling them. See, this is the uh, Charlie Brown actually recognized that that she was doing that. Um, but when they get their paychecks, they think they're actually achieving something, right? So it's 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 like it's it's Charlie Brown in the football, but they don't even realize that they're missing. You know, they think they're they're making achievements, and they think like like look at the way they they talk about the fact that you know how how hopeful they are. I have you know I I'm a uh, Spengler respecter, and I have the optimism is co- cowardice thing you know all over the place and. People make fun of me for it. But what I'm talking about is that that American conservative like mentality that just basically says that we're making like we're, we're actually making the world a better place. We're actually, you know, achieving our objectives and goals. It's like, no, you are not. You're losing. You're losing the war and you're fa- you're facilitating that loss. Um, and so, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I get m- much more frustrated with establishment conservatives, so-called um because they're the ones that that could be they're the ones that could be in opposition, um, but they refuse to to be that. And not only that, but they purge anybody to their right. It, it's not only that they're not doing anything, but anytime someone does anything, you know, good and decent, or or I guess necessary would be a better word. If anyone does anything politically necessary to actually fight back, um, the conservatives are the first ones at the door seeking to shut those people up i mean they the, the conservative movement in america has a long history since uh buckley of purging those uh would-be um opponents of the establishment of the regime and sort of making conservatism something that's palatable to the regime and making the regime something that's palatable to conservatives and i think that's the function that the conservative movement plays and just to bring the whole you know this whole uh, conversation back around, you know, the one of the most important ways it does that is by focusing on individual rights. Because if every individual has the right to to live in whatever way he wants to live and, and do all those things, well, what you actually have is subversion. You know, if you have no constraints or boundaries on the meaning of those rights, you have David French calling, uh, you know, gay marriage or transsexualism a blessing of liberty. You know, that's that's the end game of conservatism is you have to apply that rhetoric that you've religiously committed yourself to. You have to p- apply it to the very same groups of people that are seeking to undermine the uh, heritage, you know, flyover legacy Americans that you as a conservative are supposed to be representing. Um, so that's I mean, that's one of the main problems with them is is the left has managed to pit the conservative elite against the conservative base and the conservative base in America, um, you know, Sam Francis was right about them. They still have the right instincts. They still have, um, they still have the right demeanor. They still recognize the fact that the regime hates them, that the coastal elites elites want them liquidated. They understand those things. Sam Francis was right about flyover America. The problem is, is that the conservative movement is participating in their liquidation. They, so, so, and that's what, and that's exactly what Donald Trump, is all about. Um, people are still confused about the fact that a very liberal cosmopolitan real estate billionaire from New York would be their proxy. Um, and that's what he is, is a proxy because no one else stood up and defended them or co- w- was concerned about the, the, the leftist revolution. The conservatives completely sold out to the left. And so you have someone like Donald Trump who sort of stumbled and bumbled his way into the situation where he became a proxy of all of their discontent, all of their frustration over the fact that there is no opposition to the establishment in the West. And he was someone who basically the regime uh, despised. And whenever you have someone like that, I think it appeals to those who have been forgotten and and left over um, since since the end of the of the Second World War. Yeah, I think that you know, the, there's an idea you often hear in our spheres, and that is of containment. And 90% of the time you hear the phrase containment, it is best practice to completely disregard anything that comes after it. Mm-hmm. But I, I think it is important to, to basically ask the question of, 
you know, why does the American conservative movement exist, right? Does it exist as what it's, you know, pretends to be, right? Which is a, a political force or does it exist as essentially a way to collect money from certain areas of the country and funnel it into, you know, certain like media and political apparatus? Because to me, I don't see the political power coming from this political movement. Again, it doesn't seem to do what it's supposed to do or what it says it wants to do, right? And so but when we look at that, it seems to me that, you know, there's a reason that, you know, is kind of mainstream conservative figures freak out at the rising popularity of us and our friends. And I think it is not because, you know, that they're genuinely worried about, you know, Christo fascism or, you know, the, the woke right as some blithering moron has, has, you know, named us, mm -hmm. but it's effectively, we threaten the grift, right. Mm -hmm. And not saying that, you know, what we do is a grift, but just like the comparison, it becomes very obvious by comparison, mm -hmm. right. Between someone whose essentially entire job is to, you know, slowly, slowly, you know, move the, the, the trailing edge of the Overton window, you know, over time, or someone who has actual genuine, you know, dissident opinions, someone who is willing to sort of, you know, sacrifice certain things to, to make those opinions known. I mean, mm -hmm. to me, that's a, that's a world of difference. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, if you had to, if you had to ask me, what is the, the next big shakeup in American politics? I think it is entirely within this, the, you know, a, it's entirely reasonable to assume that, you know, we are going to witness the death of the American conservative movement TM. Mm -hmm. it just, and I don't say that because, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's going to be some big, you know, red pill reawakening, but just look at what's happened, right? We're seeing a lot of, a lot of shakeup, right? Mm -hmm. Both in the, the number of people who are leaving, you know, legacy organizations, you know, what happened to the Daily Wire with Candace Owens. I, I won't go into that in too much detail, but there are alliances are fractured. And mm -hmm. so to me, I think that, and to tie it back to our original conversation about rights, it seems to me that the, the, the universalists in one sense, and then they're very particularist in another sense, that seems to be a more solid alliance, you know, the, mm -hmm. the old party consensus. And it mm -hmm. still exists, right, on Ukraine and other issues. But to me, it, it seems as if, you know, we're witnessing a sea change. And anyway, CJ, we've, we've gotten massively, massively off topic. But do you have anything <laughs> yeah. you want to add to that? No, um, but I do want to bring it back around, you know, to right. So like, you know, because I know I don't know how much more time we have, but I do think we should we should follow up on on the rights topic. So what should we do now um, that rights has been completely abused and has been basically turned into a weapon for the left. I think we should focus more on, instead of ideology like rights, I think we should focus more on who we are, who we are defending and who our enemies are. And that's that who, whom, you know, Leninist phrase. But I think it captures the fact that there are friends and enemies and there's a decade is, an age is coming when we have to basically think in terms of who our friends are and who we're going to defend rather than looking for people who agree with the same propositions that we agree with. I think that sort of ideological war is going to be something that is no longer sustainable to us. And we have to say, you know, who li who uh, you know who carries on the memories and the heritage of of our people? And we have to speak in those terms rather than ideological rights, because I don't. Th I think that's a fool's errand now. I think the left has completely captured that paradigm. I think they completely own it, and I don't think that there's any, um, you know, clever logical way of explaining away <laughs> the rights of transsexuals. I think we have to say no. We don't do that in America. That's that's the answer. That's we don't. That's not consistent with our way of life. And I think that sort of mentality has to be the way that we push the um, political ball forward. Sorry, right. I spilled my coffee, so I had to grab that. But um, so no, no worries, man. It, it's it's a regular occurrence on this show, at least on my end. Yeah. So I, I think that um, I think that that has to be the mentality going forward. In other words, real political realism as opposed to political idealism has to be 
the way forward. So, um, you know, instead of getting bogged down into a, a tightly knit, elegant debate with people who want you dead about the meaning and extent uh, and definition of, of rights, why not just say, look, these are my friends. I'm going to defend them. I'm going to fight for their way of life. I mean, Tucker Carlson got into this when he said, look, we can debate the meaning of capitalism, but if your economic system is undermining my ability to give my children a future and inheritance, not, not just like a material financial inheritance, but a cultural sociological inheritance, something um, at the, at the, um, the collective state scale that I can pass on to them, they can receive from me, appreciate it and be facilitators or catalysts through which my way of life is passed on to my grandchildren. That's what I want. That's my politics. And I think that sort of realism is going to be much more powerful in attracting allies and fighting in a consistent way against a left that has spent the last few decades just completely blessed by the fact that conservatives focus on ideology and not real um, heritage, not something real that can be passed on. Uh, we're not seeking to pass on well-structured arguments. We're not seeking to pass on um, propositions that are clever and tightly knit. We're seeking to pass on our land, our memories, the symbols of our social uh, political life. Um, you know, the, these, are, these are the things that have meaning. And I think these are the things that we need to rally around. We need to rally around political realism and abandon political idealism, which just caters to the leftist revolution. So CJ, we are we are fast approaching time. If people want to find more of your work, what's the best way for them to do that? At Contra Mordor on Twitter. Um, and then I think you can just go to my name, cjayingle.com, and it leads to my Substack. Um, and make sure you, you have Ingle, E-N-G-E-L. Um, so yeah, you can find me on Substack. I probably write once every other week, um, but I'm pretty active on, on Twitter. Those are the best ways to find me. And I, I do host the Chronicles Magazine podcast too, so look that up on YouTube. Well, I highly recommend that. I think your show with Isker is is great. Some of the best, uh, some of the best host chemistry on the internet. And uh, again, man, thank you so much for coming out. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. As far as my stuff, you can find the Jay Burden Show on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere you listen to podcasts. I also have a Substack. I've started posting there more regularly. Again, hoping to get back into the swing of things. Uh, if you want to support us, Axios Remote Fitness and Coaching is the best way to do that. Uh, can't recommend it enough. And Remember, everyone, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night.